So, um, welcome on this St. Patrick's Day, uh, which is uh, great because back in the day, no Irish, no Blacks, uh, no dogs were the, uh, was the refrain. That's why I've got my uh, St. Patrick's Green on, on today, and I knew Patrick, and I can tell you he was no saint. Uh, my journeys to uh, Ireland have always been uh, uh, great, but that uh, brings us greatly to the focus, the focus of those uh, signs I just mentioned uh, today, and another one in the series of our Winners Talks. Uh, we've been delighted, but we've had inspiring leaders from Carol Johnson and uh, um, uh, Michael Jenkins uh, uh, as well, Marvin Reese, the mayor, uh, 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 last week uh, as well. Next week, we'll, we're looking at uh, medical and nursing with uh, um, Chacon, uh, uh, of course, and Dolores from Trinidad. This week, though, the focus is on carnival, and I'm delighted with one of my uh, dearest uh, friends, uh, Latoya McAllister-Jones, the executive director of St. Paul's uh, Carnival. He's done an amazing job uh, in terms of keeping the, going. The first British uh, uh, carnival that was on, online, that was of a, a Caribbean uh, origin, uh, as well as uh, being uh, uh, my f former head of operations at Tajima Radio, a, a long career in uh, London before moving to Bristol. She's going to talk about the, the influence of Carnival and moving that, that, that forward. We're also going to uh, talk about uh, generations. And um, just from one picture, last week we had uh, uh, moving uh, images and uh, Mian uh, and Ying has uh, brought Van Lee Burke and we, we, we looked at an, a, an image that she had of her son uh, cooking. We'll talk about more of that later. So I want to say a big thank you at the beginning to um, Tom Buckley, uh, my co-lead uh, Alicia Airy and of course um, uh, Mian as well, as well as you know, the great staff that you have been brilliant in getting this project up together uh, and keeping it going and these series of talks up until Windrush Day the 22nd. Our students have been brilliant already. We've got uh, suggestions for poetry, which we'll have later um, from one of our students, uh, Chanel uh, R. A. Bartry, as well. Poetry Screen have been in touch. We've had films uh, going to be made, uh, and uh, I'm still feeling questions even up to, to uh, later tonight. Uh, in terms of them uh, uh, getting in, engaged, so things are looking uh, really good. But it's generations we wanted to look at today. The influence of um, the tiny uh, trail of islands that uh, snake through from uh, where my parents are, where Latoya's parents are in Guyana, going right up uh, to the edges of, uh, of Cuba up in, and Jamaica up in the north of islands that were known as the Caribbean from the Caribs and all the West Indies, depending on your point of view. That influence of carnival, that tradition has been uh, there for uh, uh, years in terms of mimicking the masters um, as uh, Olivette Otelle is uh, uh, um, referenced in her book uh, as, as well. So, so much great tradition right the way through to Claudia Jones here in the, uh, in the UK following uh, a mini riot in Notting Hill and in Nottingham in the year of 1958. Same, um, Not uh, Notting Hill Carnival, 59. And St. Paul's Carnival was one of the great uh, institutions of, of cities of the UK, one of our great contributions of food, of music, of uh, entertainment. And, and I'm sure, I'm sure that I can't prove it. If we, if we check the timings on some people's DNA in Bristol, I'm sure there'll be a few uh, little carnival babies. But I don't <laughs> want to say any of the toys. Uh, thunder here now. Can you welcome the executive director of St. Paul's Carnival? Uh, this is Latoya McAllister Jones. Take it away, Latoya. What an introduction. Thank you, Roger. Um, thank you to all of you who are here tonight. And um, I just want to say thank you to Yui and Creative Connects for inviting me to uh, here to speak with you. So, you know, as Roger's already um, prefaced, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my own connection to the Windrush generation, um, exploring how that connects with St Paul's Carnival touch and I'll touch on themes of resilience and legacy and, and as Roger said we'll, we'll look at um, generations as well. Um, I want to say next slide please like they do at the at the briefings. Um, so origins, me, my origins. Um, I've, I've put oranges in, origins in um, as a word and a reminder, um, one of the things that I do, one of the many hats that I wear is uh, a facilitator. I, I, I do peer coaching with uh, social leaders in the social space. And we do an exercise called, called Origins, which is about 
helping groups to connect with each other and understand understand what drives us um, right from our origins. And I've every time I do this exercise, I've been doing it for over five years, but every time I do it, I'm I'm kind of shocked at just how much being a child of Windrush um, and uh, of African Caribbean uh, ancestry, how much that drives who I am, what I do, um, the work that I've I've become involved with. So I decided to talk to you tonight about my origins and and place it within within that kind of framework. So I was born in Hackney, um, London. You can hear from my accent. Windrush generation, Guyanese economic migrants. Um, I'm actually half Guyanese and half Jamaican, um, but grew up culturally Guyanese um, in a house with my mum and my nan who are Guyanese. I count myself as being first generation, so I'm the first generation born here. I think unusually for someone of my age, I'll disclose I'll be 46 this year. Um, most of my friends have parents that were also born in, in um, England, but my mum was, was born in Guyana and, and came here when she was 10. So what, what does that mean um, for me as a uh, growing up and who I've become? So while I was growing up, um, my nan would talk to about stories of back home. Oh, I heard about back home all of the time, so much so that I thought that we came from a place called back home. Um, and I grew up in a, an estate w which was full of uh, African Caribbean people from different islands, different accents. Um, but we all shared that uh, connection of being um, African Caribbean. Uh, our cultures were similar, our outlook on life, our traditions. And I remember uh, bank holiday weekend, August bank holiday weekend, when Notting Hill Carnival happens, all of the windows would be open, everyone would be playing soccer. Um, it was it was just a, a a real kind of visceral experience of of growing up in with, with people that look like you and understand you in and around an estate that was full of people that didn't look like me and in you know the school that I went to also people that didn't look like me so that's a really important part of my growing up uh, one of the things that I really miss about um, London and from my childhood is spending time on a Friday with my nan and my brother going to Ridley Road Market some of you know it others maybe some of you don't but it's a huge market in Dalston um, Caribbean market and um, I would spend time there every Friday, absolutely loved it. Um, my nan would bump into people from back home and would be there for ages waiting for her to finish her conversations and watching people buy um, their cassava, their sweet potato, their, you know, their um, callaloo and all of those foods that we, we share in common that, that kind of speak to our cultural food heritage and, and our journey. Um, that was one of my first real senses of being part of a of a black community of a Caribbean community. My family are um, we, we, we we're tiny. I grew up in a house of five people, and we did I didn't have cousins in this country. We didn't have family, so that connection to Ridley Road Market has always been really important to me. And when I moved to Brighton, um, many many years later, every time I visited my mum back in London, she would phone me and say, where are you? And I'd say, I'm in Ridley Road Market, I'll be with you shortly. Because I always had to touch base with Ridley Road Market because it just, it was a, it's a, it's a feeling of home. Um, I've spent time in the Caribbean, um, but the nearest I've got to Guyana is actually Trinidad. So that's one of the things that um, I have yet to do. So for me, when I say culturally Guyanese, I mean the food and the traditions of my family. Um, the things that I learned at my grandmother's knee and the things that connect me to that place back home. So carnival. The first time I went to carnival, I was eight years old. It was Notting Hill Carnival. Um, and my family still talk about this. I think I spoke about the the excitement of being at carnival was something that I'd never, I'd had never experienced it before as an eight year old. Um, the the food the the people the sounds um I, i'm a natural extrovert anyway so a big party is something that i'm all i've always loved but i think for uh, the first thing i think that that experience probably led me to the role that i'm in now and again where, where i grew up in a very small family without cousins and and things that really tied me back to guyana um carnival became this uh this place where I could touch base 
really, really embed myself and and um, celebrate and thrive in a in an environment with people like me. Um, and that was that was a really, really important. So for St Paul's Carnival, it's biggest Bristol's biggest cultural export. Um, it's in his fifty third year, I think. I might have made a mistake there. Um, and we celebrated last year, even though we had to, to, to cancel due to COVID, we celebrated by um, delivering Spirit Up, United at Home. And that was the first UK um, online carnival, something that I'm tremendously proud of. Um, it brings in, we welcome 100,000 people into the city each year to celebrate with us. Um, that's a huge amount of people that descend on Bristol and into St Paul's. It's one of Bristol's best known brands. I knew about St Paul's Carnival long before I ever thought about moving here. Um, some of the, the, the things that people don't necessarily know about Carnival is that it has a, a massive e positive economic impact on our city. In 2018, we um, did an economic impact report and that report estimated that we over the carnival weekend we bring in 5.1 million into the city um, which is a huge positive impact for um, both the community within St Paul's as half of that is spent within the, the footprint of, of carnival um, and then in our hotels and our restaurants and our hospitality sector so um, I think it's one of the things that people don't know, particularly the business community don't really know about Carnival, but I, I always want to illustrate that to people because it is one of the many positive um, impacts that, that Carnival has. Oh, next slide please. So this is just some of the fantastic stuff that happened um, over the Spirit Up period. So we, when we cancelled, um, we knew we wanted to do something. We cancelled the day after the lockdown last year, so we're coming up to the anniversary of that. Um, we knew as an organisation that we wanted to offer something to the community that was positive, um, that would give us some joy and something to look forward to throughout a really challenging three months of, of lockdown and disconnection. Carnival is all about connection. Um, we also knew that we wanted to um, to offer our community artists work in a year that their entire calendar had been ripped away from them and I think that we 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 achieved that and um it was a it was a real moment for me um Roger will probably um have a go at me afterwards for saying this but I don't I don't count myself as a as a creative I always say that um but I've come to re that that <laughs> that spirit up experience I've actually changed that Roger I now say that I don't count myself as an artist but I am creative and this and delivering the carnival in this way last year um, really helped me to understand how much creative thinking goes into to, to delivering something like carnival the kind of the textures of it um, we spent a lot of time working with um, community businesses to, to, to give a platform um, to the people in our community doing great work supporting our youth supporting our com um, other community businesses um, and showcasing our, our, create, our, our wonderful Caribbean carnival arts. So it was, it was a great journey um, for all of us, a hard one, but um, uh, something that I'm tremendously proud of. Um, this is one of the things, that, one of the moments from, from Spirit Up that, was, that gives me the most pleasure. Um, as some of you may know, we start, we kick off Carnival Day each year with a, a brunch to, uh, for our elders to, to celebrate and pay homage to them, but also to thank our sponsors and um, the people that make it happen. We were obviously weren't able to make that um, happen last year, so we brought brunch to our elders. So we've got a team of volunteers, volunteer drivers, um, we used one of our local um, community restaurants and we delivered um, food to uh, 50 of our community elders and um, here's just a couple of pictures of people receiving their their package um, and yeah it was a way to involve um, the that that generation that that basically delivered us um, this great carnival that has grown and gone from strength to strength in its 53 years community activism now I for me this is um, a really important part of the um, Bristol experience. Um, we 
we are a city that um, I think that, that has a lot to celebrate in terms of community activism. I've put down here the bus boy, uh, Bristol bus boycott, um, led by some of our key community elders, uh, Paul Stevenson, Audley Evans, Prince Brown and, and Roy Hackett, one of our, our founding members, uh, and also Owen Henry. And some of these guys are also seven saints that you can see um, in the beautiful murals uh, around uh, St Paul's. Um, that that bus boycott led directly into the creation of a vital piece of legislation, the Race Relation Act in, in 1968. Um, their community activism, I think, um, as, as Windrush migrants, um, have con ha it continues to resonate throughout, um, I think, the fabric of Bristol and, and what it's become, how it's evolved from um, the, those days. Um, the felling of the Colston statue, uh, you know, that is still being talked about today. Um, uh, I think there's very, very few days that you can um, pick up, a, you can't pick up a podcast or hear a news item that talks about the impact of that. Um, it caused a wave of actions um, around the world and sh showed Bristol as a, as a city of everyday activism and of people um, daring to make change. I think that that is a really important part of our legacy and um, who we are as a city, but also the, the, how the Windrush generation have um, and, and their descendants have um, been significant in, in, in that fabric of, of who we are. Um, and then we have the, the reparations movement and you, you'll, you'll know that um, Bristol City Council recently passed a motion for an atonement and reparations plan to address the city's role in the transatlantic slave trade. Um, an amazing city of um, everyday activism that is something for us to be proud of and that as um, descendants of the Windrush generation we have played a really important part in, in bringing these things to bear. This slide here um, is a picture of our St Paul's Carnival education programme, which is our education programme is one of the biggest products that we have. Um, we have a, a carnival focused um, programme with our primary school children focusing on heritage and, and culture um, it, through dance, costume making and um, drumming, which culminates on, on Carnival Day when you see them in the procession. This is a picture um, of an, uh, an arts project that we are doing in col collaboration with Colin Moody. You can see the picture here in the middle is the, uh, his iconic picture of, of Colston um, being toppled into to the water. Um, and we worked with Jen Reed and went into some secondary schools for the first time. And this was really about this, this thing that I call everyday activism. Um, it was really about us uh, talking to our secondary age schools children, helping them contextualise and understand um, how that made them feel, what they want the future of Bristol to be, uh, what's their role in that really importantly, because I think some of these these challenges, these, it, these topics can be challenging to talk about, uncomfortable to talk about for many people, but I think when you put it through the eyes of our, our youngers, our, our people who are going to be the next um, generation of carnival leaders, of community activists, of um, people in in city hall running running Bristol, um, these are these are the generations that we we need to um, we need to work with. We need to support. We need to help them understand the the evolution of their city. So this, we went into schools with these canvases, and you can see the writing on these canvases of the impression from our young people of how they felt what they were inspired by, what change they want to see. Again, it's a piece of work that I'm incredibly proud of and we'll be rolling out um, with more secondary schools this year. The women, Bristol women. So this, I needed to talk about the women um, because we're surrounded by uh, the legacy or, and the, the, the current activism of, of a great bunch of of African Caribbean women who have made a difference in our city, um, leading the way to so many firsts um, and empowering the next generation of women. And that's women like me who have you know, come to, to Bristol um, and been able to take up a role of community service. Um, some of those women include um, Seydou Jerde, 
her fantastic work with with BSWN Black Southwest Network, supporting the growth of our Black led community sector and um, and community and business sector um, after years of austerity and and um, our Black led organisations being being the first to feel that austerity and many of them um, folded due to due to that um, that pressure that financial pressure and her work is 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 really helping to grow that set those sectors again and and put us at the forefront of um, the city's minds we have Marty J Marty Burgess our previous chair um, first African Caribbean merchant venturer we have doctor and counsellor Carol Johnson who who was here a couple of weeks ago currently the interim chair of, of St Paul's Carnival a counsellor for Ash, um, Ashley Ward Asha Craig, one of one of my heroes, um, our deputy mayor, um, a, a great example of act, activism, um, walking its talk, um, and being out there doing, making the change uh, in the city that need that we need to see. Princess Campbell, Bristol's first Black Ward sister, Councillor Cleo Lake, um, one of the, the the kind of leading lights in the reparations um, movement and and bringing that to there most recently. You can see a picture of Barbara Dettering, one of our um, founding members and a fellow Guyanese, and uh, uh, Roger mentioned and Dolores Chacon, one of my one of my um, friends and uh, colleagues from Bristol Black Carers, leading a fantastic, amazing response to COVID-19 with the food bank service for our elders. These men and women, for me, um, and, and I think for the city, are the embodiment of the impact of the Windrush generation and beyond. So why carnival? Why carnival for me? Why am I here? Um, why was this job something that I took? I decided to take on. Um, we were our, our Black History Month program last year was massively um, inspired by the events of um, or leading from the Black Lives Matter marches, um, and I think what I saw. And why I think that it really resonated with me as a leader of Carnival is that I, Carnival is its origins are about resistance and rebellion. Um, and I saw a, you know, something that that was very kind of um, not in, interwoven with the story of Bristol, interwoven with the everyday activism that you can see in this city, and that the Windrush generation have um, have handed over to us. Um, several of our of St Paul's Carnival founders were at the forefront of making that that change. Um, I personally am 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 driven by um, social justice. I spent 20 years in the in the homelessness sector, and then moved into the arts when I met Roger um, and Paul Hassan uh, and and started to work at um, U Ujima Radio, and that was the first time that I really understood how um, the arts could be a conduit for social justice. Um, and that's that's how I see this role in, in Carnival. I see what, what Carnival, uh, over and above the fantastic day of celebration, the sharing of our cultural her heritage um, with our youngers and um, also with the, with the wider city and, and people who, that come from all around. Um, it has a uh, it is is really well placed to provide socio-economic um, opportunities for our young people um, to speak to themes of social justice, um, and these these are the things that really really drive me. So the the roots of um, carnival and its rebellion resistance, I think, is really important for us to remember, um, and important for when people come to join us on the streets of of St Paul's each year for them to understand that that origins and what it's about. It's not um, in and of itself a big party. There is there is so much more to know and understand. And I think one of the things I'm very proud of in terms of the digital carnival is that we had a very strong educational strand running through it to illustrate the kind of origins and what carnival is about and why African Caribbean people in Bristol, in London, in Leeds, in all of those places that have um, a, a carnival tradition, why we feel so strongly about it, why it's so important to us. I think it's also a good uh, point to say here that that carnival um, is also a, a social cohesion project. So many of those carnivals sprung up as a way, not just a way of um, of speaking to and warding off the 
um, the challenges that the Windrush generation um, faced when they came to this country, invited to rebuild after the Second World War. It was also a way of um, connecting with our new, the new communities we found ourselves in, sharing our culture, helping us understand who we, we, who we are, who we were. Um, so Carnival has, a, a, again, a great um, opportunity to bring people together. And I gave you the figure of 100,000 people that we welcome into the city each, each year. And that, that's, you know, that, that is social cohesion um, in action. It also allows us to celebrate our great tradition of, of oral storytelling. Te uh, um, and passing down history and knowledge to our own generation, the next generation. Um, and it gives us the power to tell our own stories in our own voices. Um, there are several different carnival traditions and, and the way that they're carried out in the islands are, are they will differ from island to island depending on the, um, the environment um, and how, how that carnival was, um, the genesis of that carnival. And it, that allows us to tell our story from not just one single narrative. And I think that that's really important. Um, uh, I think sometimes that in, in the UK, there is a, uh, a risk of, of lumping us all together in one, one group. And, and whilst we share, we, we share much together, um, we have very different narratives and very different stories. And I think it's very important for us to be able to tell that in our own voices. I think lastly here, it says going, it should say ongoing. I, I see Carnival, St Paul's Carnival, as an ongoing conversation with our city um, about some of the, the, the real issues that, and the challenges that we, we still continue to face. Um, the continuance of, of St Paul's Carnival, the strength of it, um, the love that the city has for it um, allows us to continue a conversation that is about our place in this city, our contribution to the, the evolution of this city, um, and together with with the city, ha thinking about how we secure the legacy of Carnival for the for the upcoming generations. Oh, I'm going backwards. And that's me. That's my story. That's a story of St Paul's Carnival, our everyday activism. I'll hand back to you, Roger. Uh, not, not so fast. Uh, I think that was, a, that was an amazing uh, presentation, spot on at uh, in around uh, 20 minutes. It was just uh, fantastic to, to, to see our, uh, our culture through another uh, uh, lens through, as we've had, our, had, had a lens through leadership. Uh, we've had a through film and uh, and how it's inspired others and uh, my own and personal stories, my own uh, as well. But today uh, we looked at it through Carnival, both personal and uh, in the realm. So much there um, around your generational and how it's a kind of a, a affected you from from London. Uh, I love the things around Bristol women, which we're going to co uh, uh, cover, uh, and but uh, want, and also the. The kind of influence into the kind of UK and uh, it's kind of global uh, as, as significant. So, uh, just in the chat, um, uh, a number of uh, um, people putting things in. Thank you for uh, really interesting. Uh, Jamie uh, Sina Dickens, uh, uh, thanks for coming again. I know you were there last week. So great that you got. Uh, you again, F uh, Fionn, who I'm uh, uh, talking to and I'll be in touch with. Uh, so it's a big thank you. Round of applause from Sophie Kirk, another uh, student I'm in touch with uh, to create some uh, uh, great projects. Tom Buckley's got uh, uh, a round of applause, as is Mian, thumbs up. Thank you for, uh, who says thank you for sharing the passion. And Chanel uh, chimes in with a, a big thank you. Keep those uh, comments coming if you've got any uh, questions or open up your mic. Uh, so. Let's talk about, um, we were, we're going to talk about uh, family and generations and putting the S in, in there from that photograph uh, a bit later after uh, we've heard from uh, Chanel. So let's just do the, the, the focus on, on you. In terms of the, um, when did it dawn on you that you were part of something special as in the, uh, of, of Windrush? Um, was that something your parents passed to you? Was it something you uh, learned in a 
uh, you had a whole term at school, uh, perhaps he says tongue in cheek, or um, uh, when, when did it dawn to you uh, that you were part of something that was different, perhaps to you? I know we've all got special stories, but, but in terms of being part of that uh, Windrush continuum. That's a really interesting question. I think it's an accumulative thing, Roger, to be quite honest. Um, the things that have sprung into my mind as you asked that question, the first thing, do it on a kind of linear um, linear sequence, was being about eight years old, met, yeah, being about eight years old in primary school, and um, my best friend at the time was a girl um, with Trinidadian parents, and we used to sit next to each other, and we had to do a project, and we decided to do it about the Caribbean. And I remember having a real um, bit of a ding dong with her about um, whether Guyana was part of the Caribbean or, or part of the West Indies. Um, and I remember that that ding dong uh, very uh, very clearly. Um, I think I think growing up with that kind of back, and I think, yeah, that back home, my my nan. Um, always made back home sound like a special place um, even though I know that times were hard for her there the the culture and the heritage and the stories of Guyana just that you know she was a great was is um, a great storyteller and those stories resonated deeply with me um, and as my nan has become older she has dementia now so um, it's it's um, a slightly different thing, but I, I hear me and my mum and my brothers. We all do nanisms. We all kind of um, tell her, use her little phrases, which are all from back home. So um, her own community activism, active in the community, part of her church. Um, she was a great one for service. Um, Something that I've been reflecting on since I, uh, since I put that presentation together was that my nan, part of the Windrush generation, came came here and started working in the NHS as so many of our our parents did. She worked in Bethnal Green Hospital when I was growing up as an orderly. So you know, low rung. Um, she caught TB meningitis in her brain when in when I was about five and came within a cat's whisker of dying um and it was i guess a ppe story um that she wasn't properly protected um from all of the materials that she was cleaning up as an orderly um and from that story and experience that that had a massive impact on me because i shared a room with my nan growing up and she was in hospital for a very long time and she almost didn't make it. We, we literally had the call to get hold of our, our relatives in Guyana to, to let them know the time was near, but she pulled through. Wind forward to 2020 and I was accepted. I, did, I interviewed for an associate non-executive director role with um, North Bristol Trust. Um, and while I've been doing this presentation, I was just thinking about the, the, the corridor of the Windrush generation for my nan, Bethnal Green Hospital, an orderly that, that caught TB meningitis and almost died. Someone at the lowest rung of the, the pecking order, no influence, no power, to um, her granddaughter, who now sits on a board at, at an NHS trust and has that um, influence and power. Um, and that to me is, again, an illustration of the Windrush generation, our impact, um, our journey. Um, and how important it is for us to be at that table and for our voices to be heard. Has that been a, a, an easy or difficult continuum? It's a difficult continuum. It's a definitely a difficult continuum. Um, but it's 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 kind of bittersweet. It's a it's a bittersweet feeling. Um, I am the woman that I am today because of the women that grew me. Um, and uh, when I talk, when I do anything like this, I talk about my nan. I rarely talk about my mum. My mum is great, um, but it's my nan that that I that the fire that I have is is hers. She passed that down to me. Um, so finding myself in that in this position um, of being at completely the opposite end of the spectrum to where she was when she arrived, a testament to her um, her journey her bringing us her grandchildren up and in imbuing us with that um, idea of 
um, community service of, of being an active part in your community of playing a part of, of stepping up and and um, knowing when it's your time um, but at the same time I, I think wow this is a institution that my nan almost died in when she was invited to come here and and um, help rebuild so it's it's bittersweet it feels like a culmination of a great journey um, but it also feels um, like a difficult reality to um, to contend with. So uh, let's look at the, the the kind of better element uh, uh, of that first before we move into the you know, kind of like night and day. Let's move into the kind of dark side of it. Why do you think that's been such a uh, a struggle for uh, both our, our parents, our, our grandparents, and and to where you are? Are, are now today um, in large numbers. Obviously, we've been uh, since since 1948. We were here as a presence before, and particularly around this project. When we, uh, we're, we're kind of looking at the Caribbean, we have that influence. We had uh, Emmanuel uh, Aduke talking uh, previously, uh, giving an African perspective as well as Adam with uh, Murray with African parents. So we are spreading it through the uh, the uh, diaspora, but. Just getting back to the the, the, the the you know kind of struggle when we think about the riots risings when we think about Rimrus uh, scandal I was just reading another story uh, uh, just uh, just yesterday and just sheer recognition and, and racism well, why do you think it has been such a struggle for the our, our um, partner country I won't even say host country because we're part of a, a Commonwealth and uh, obviously controversially part of a, a former empire. Uh, and colonialism. Why do you think it's been uh, that's been a struggle? A struggle for me personally, or struggle for us as a as a for us as a people, not for you personally. Um, why has it been such a struggle for us as a people? What to go to go on to find ourselves in different spaces at um at this point? Yeah, you you, met, you specifically mentioned bitter. So what 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 what? Why has that been? Wouldn't you think that story of your uh, you know the story that legacy story going from yeah. Um, uh, uh, nursing, the same as my uh, uh, mother, and I know uh, Alicia likes to stay uh, uh, quiet. She's got, uh, you know, similar and the same story to in terms of protection to grandparents and our women. I will come to that uh, uh, shortly. So you'd think those stories and narratives would be one that would be in, in, in embraced by uh, the, the community. But you, you've mentioned the word bitter, and I share that uh, as well. And I detect that from my my own mother uh, as now. But for our, our our new listeners here, they would know about that, that kind of bitterness uh, and where that kind of comes from. So, I you know, that, think that hasn't been uh, taken uh, forward now because we've got a whole new generation who are marching alongside us. I mean, you know, they did during the 80s as, uh, uh, as well. But, um, well, you know, where does that kind of bitterness uh, uh, kind of come from, which I share, by the way? It, yeah, no, and we've talked about this. And I think one of the, one of the mm -hmm. conversations that I had with you during um, lockdown last year is about activism and it's about why um, are we having the conversations about um, uh, our, about inequality in uh, the, the way that my mother was having those com conversations in her time? The, the bitterness is that what, um, a, a factor in that bitterness is that whilst we now st we, we, that we, we are at the table in many places, I, I talked about you know people like Marty Burgess, um, Saidu Jerdy, my, myself. Um, we are invited to speak. We are at many tables because um, people want to hear what we have to say, and and we we have a degree of influence. Um, and you know, not just us. There are many um, Black British people of African um, uh, ancestry who who have also um, who are also change makers and have influence and and um, make real change. The fact that we still have to do that is part of the bitterness. Um, the fact that we, um, you know, through, throughout COVID, I mean, co COVID is, 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 a, is a real example of um, how that, those lines of inequality are, are still there in our societies. Um, the, the disproportionate negative impacts on people, uh, people of colour and, and African um, Caribbean descent um, in terms of, of being seriously sick from COVID and, and dying. Um, the bitterness comes from from a really a lack of understanding. The bitterness comes from there being a surprise to some people that is this, that is not a genetic reason; it's a socio-economic reason. 
um, that, that that bitterness comes from me knowing, from you, Roger, knowing, from, from people from our community, knowing this to be a, 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 a true, um, something that is true. Um, and if, if you, if po policy makers that were interested to ask us about those reasons wouldn't have to be in shock and surprise that it's not about genetics, it's about socio-economic inequality. And that has always been the case. So the part of the bitterness is that despite um, many of us that have reached positions of power and influence, um, in 2021, we are still experiencing significant, huge, life-changing, life-destroying levels of inequality. And that, um, you know, again, uh, you, you know, <laughs> look at what's happening with um, Meghan and, and Harry. Um, we, are, we are always asked to prove the case that the inequality is there. We're always, and that is a, as a microaggression, it's triggering all of those fancy new words. Um, w even when you are in a, power, in, in a position of power and influence, it is still our case to prove that these things are real and are happening despite the evidence being all around us. Um, so that, yeah, yeah, I, I guess there's a, um, a bitterness that, that comes from the being in a host country that expects us to be grateful for, for being allowed to be around the table. Um, and, and that, yeah, that, that bristles, that, yeah, that bristles a lot because it says to me that um, the fight of my nan's generation, of her father's generation, of my mum's generation, of uh, my generation is not over. So I look at it through the eyes of my children um, who are um, mixed race, uh, part me, part their um, Welsh dad, um, that they, they will also have to take up the mantle um, to, to take this forward. And it saddens me that we that with all the power and influence that that we have gained, I, I don't know how much traction we have made into that 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 issue. Excellent. That's exactly what I was kind of uh, 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 fishing for in my long-winded uh, uh, way. I wanted to really tap into that. Uh, that that business is the worst of it is the denial again. Well, I'm not a gang. Well, I have to prove a gang. The statistics, structural racism, the inequalities Another in the education inquiry. system. Uh, um, uh, um, and I'm I'm kind of you know personally, I'm kind of moving away more from the individual kind of acts of mean, uh, meanness kind of philosophy and going towards you, you know those other cases. Stuart Hall, um, for those who want to look up uh, a great philosopher. British philosophy has got an institute in Birmingham. It's over 40 of, of reports that have been made on, on race uh, since the Windrush generation, since even the 70s and 80s when I, we were growing up. Rampton report into education, uh, Scarman report into riots, McPherson report, uh, David Lammer report, and so another 40 we can have. So the recommendations are, 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 are clear. I want to move us into, in, into the light now. And, and, and again, just, just the, Staying with, I know there's so many we can talk about in terms of uh, NHS, but staying with carnival and, and, and culture. So in terms of making that case, and the, you know, um, this case that you, you've said um, has been within our graphs probably since the, uh, the beginning of carnival, and is a clear business case, a clear economic value, a clear social value. I joked about uh, it, but I, I, I am being serious in terms of I know many relationships, good relationships, marriages, uh, uh, as well as children that have been born out of, of Carnival. So if you have that economic uh, and social case, uh, you, you know, uh, 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 put forward, uh, you've now made that uh, digital, you've doing, um, uh, you've always done, because you've said about the, in terms of looking after our, our, our elders, and uh, uh, again, the, the timings don't work out for our elders to, to be joining us because it's a uh, age, but they will, um, they're, they're in touch, we're looking at a project uh, um, for them, which I'll talk about shortly, but again, again, how are we going to use this, this this now that you've made the online cultural digital case and you've now made it in terms of the hotels uh, uh, factor? How, how do we use it, uh, uh, it further to, to advance it that, uh, around culture, around uh, uh, black arts and, uh, uh, and around engagement? Because, as, as I said, the, 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 the interest in the projects and carnival 
doesn't just stem from uh, just people who look like you and I uh, and Alicia and, and Mian. It's uh, a whole range of people who want to get involved, as I'm going to show a film uh, a bit later in terms of what, what we can do. So, so it's, it's, how do we better make that cultural case going forward? Um, I think this is an interesting one. Um, I've had a business planning away day um, with my board the beginning to, uh, the beginning of today. I've been um, on on Zoom or one of these chats all day today. Um, and what we what we've been talking about is that is that business case, that income generation case. Um, black, you know, one of one of the reasons why um, I'm so supportive of Sadu Jodi's work is because it's all evidence based and evidence led. And that's the that is the the language that um, that people understand. Um, I think that we need to get better at gathering evidence. Right. Um, I think we need to. And Roger, we've had this conversation many times. We need to get better at not accepting the crumbs from tables um, and to um, advance our own narrative. And I think one of the things that Carnival does well is to be able to anecdotally talk about the social impact as I have done to today. What I think we do less well is to um, gather the evidence of that social impact. So one of the things that, that St Paul's Carnival um, will be focusing on is gathering those case, case studies, gathering that evidence um, that enables us to have a really strong um, business case for the the future sustainability of of, of carnival I, I i i mentioned that um one of the the 5.1 million that we bring into the city that is not widely known um it's not widely understood um and it's something that i think our organizations need to get better at articulating um carnivals across the uk are, are, are you know have all experience these challenges um so i think uh, what i think you you talked about coming into the light so um i want to turn these challenges into opportunities um the opportunity of covid total lemons that we have to make lemonade out of and the opportunity of covid was to go digital and that digital platform gave us an understanding that we we could have a reach of 250,000 people which is you know more than it's, it's more than twice the people that physically come to carnival so that is a case for um for brands for advertisers for 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 platforming more artists for connecting um with the caribbean and having a global connect globally connected carnival so i think the looking into the light looking into the brightness the other side of that that bittersweet is that we we stand in a moment of time that is unique. You know, our uh, activists like Angela Davis, um, after the the the, the seismic, seismic events of last year, you know, she she has stated that she's never seen anything quite like this in all of her years of activism. I think that people are listening and understanding more than they ever have done before the systemic issues um, that we face. So I think that we there is a, an opportunity right now for us to work together across um, the social divides, across the ethnic uh, ethnicity divides, to um, to make that change that's going to last, to to right. do things differently. Um, but I also the, I guess my word of caution is that um, that window will close. Um, so we have to be mindful that that we use that opportunity to do something um, that is lasting with it. Well, I can I can already hear those hinges uh, closing. <laughs> with um, it been well old by what about is um, and uh, uh, a whole load of false equivalences that uh, uh, that are out there. But that's that perfectly articulates uh, how. Uh, moving from the bitterness into the light, and, and it's uh, it's it's data. It's the uh, five point one million you said. Indeed. So I didn't know that figure, and and uh, I I can readily accept that. Yeah, I don't think you know not just go along and have a good time. That this is this is good good uh, good business all all all, all, it's, all around. So it's good business. It's good right. business, and um, that that social impact piece, understanding what what. Um, 
the, the critical social impacts we have for young people, the next generation of leaders, is, is I think, a, a really important part. Absolutely. Questions are starting to come in. Um, so the first one from Mian. Uh, how do you work with police during carnivals? This is a really interesting one. Um, because of the reputation of carnival, I think carnival has um, a challenge with its, its reputation from, from years gone by. Um, my experience of working with the police um, and, and the, the, the kind of emergency blue light services in Bristol um, is that the, their approach um, they work hand in glove with us. Um, I, I have to, uh, I've got very positive things to say about the police operations in the last 2018 and 2019. Um, they understand that um, a heavy uniform presence within the footprint of Carnival is, is not desirable. So it's that the operation is all about intel. It's all about um, what they do before and leading up to the Carnival and how they interact or intercept any um, challenging elements that, that might be coming into the city. Um, we, like I say, we work hand in glove. Um, I, 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 when I first joined Carnival and did I, my first kind of uh, tabletop exercise, it's called, where you bring together all of the blue light services, the security, and we war game a number of scenarios. Um, Carnival is a massive, it's considered a major um, event. The, the health and safety, of it is critical because you can imagine what happens to us reputationally if anything goes wrong um, and they are really supportive of the event they understand that to not have carnival will have really negative repercussions between um, the community and the city so as a as a city and I can't speak to what it's like anywhere else but I know in Bristol as a city it has all been about how do we facilitate carnival how do we make it happen safely how do we work together in the most um, effective ways so after carnival we we do a debrief we look at what worked what didn't work and that feeds into our planning for the next year so I would say that we work really well with um, Avon Constabulary Avon and Somerset Constabulary and um, their sensitivity to how that event needs to be policed is is really appreciated Great stuff. And I, I'll add on there, I mean, well before um, certain Donald J. Trump uh, came onto the situation, there's been misinformation in communities for a, a long, long time. One of the ones around uh, police and um, from my dealings over decades of dealing with them, um, it, you know, they're in full support of, of, of Carnival. They know it's going to take place. Uh, they've even not charged uh, well before um, Latoya was there, not charged Carnival on, on, on occasions. Uh, and uh, they're all for people gathering safely. That's a key thing. Um, not like driving over my toes uh, on, on trucks any longer. Or uh, and remember that the Toya now has to, the, unlike her predecessors, um, where cars uh, uh, could uh, travel on safely, they're now used as uh, uh, weapons in some occasions. So there has to be a plan for all of that, all of that logistics that has to go in. But generally, even in some set police over the years are are, are in favour, and that's again around partnerships about working with uh what i call our enemies and and, and frenemies uh, uh as well another question, yeah another question that's come in uh another good one uh the wider southwest is generally famous for winter carnivals uh is there any link up between the two carnival cultures that's from the um yes and no um the i guess the carnival the way I see it, the, the carnival framework, um, which dif differs from festivals, is that it's open access and that it is it's a real community event. So anyone can come. It's free. Um, and that and, and I think therein lies the, the, the similarities. It really is about um, the community. Um, I think the Caribbean carnival traditions are are distinctly different from um, the kind of. Uh, uh, English folk, folk type carnivals, but it, 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 and I think they're distinctly different in in um, what they look like um, and the. But I think that where their similar similarities are is that they are heritage events. They're they are about um, cultural heritage. Ours is um, about the 
kind of carnival and Caribbean and West African arts that that tradition and and like I say the kind of carnival was born out of um, resistance and rebellion to to being subjugated. Um, the winter carnivals don't have that tradition, but it that it is about culture and and heritage of but from an English point of view. And how well a supplementary question to that? How how, how well would you say you link up with the uh, the UK? Uh, uh, carnivals and also those uh, um, uh, in Rio, in uh, New Orleans, where I've, I've done to, been to a couple of Mardi Gras, and of course uh, Trinidad. Or are they? <clears throat> so um, we we are part of uh, St Paul's Carnival is um, part of something called Carnival Network South, um, of which um, there are all types of carnivals are part of that. So um, we come together to talk about the challenges faced by carnival, all kinds of carnivals. Um, we actually, one of the, it was on the uh, 15th and 16th of March last year, a year ago, almost to the day, um, where we hosted in, in Bristol at Malcolm X. It almost didn't happen because of COVID. We hosted um, a greener carnival. Um, so looking at carnivals uh, and sustainability going into the future. And that was carnivals all over the country Kate, were, were part of that. So we, we are part of a larger carnival family that is not just about the Caribbean carnival um, tradition. Um, and I think COVID has probably pulled us closer together where we think we need to we need to speak with a more united voice and have a more uniform approach to how we... we um, we address the challenges laying ahead of us because one of the one of the questions that still that we, we haven't that hasn't been answered is how does an open access event where you don't know who's coming you don't know where they're coming from you don't know where they're going back to how does that take place through the lens of covid festivals will all have fences around them they will be ticket paying they will know who's coming and they could also, um, they have access and en entry and exit points where they can say, let me see your your COVID vaccination, your vaccination and passport. Carnivals don't have that. Um, part of our USP is that we're open access. So uh, there is there are groups that are working together to, um, to lobby um, central government to be part of that conversation and how carnivals come back bigger and better. Absolutely. I mean, your 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 questions keep firing us into new uh, atmosphere. So I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna make you work for your thing for your supper today because you just mentioned greener carnivals and one of the uh, pandemics you've mentioned COVID. We've uh, both touched upon uh, the racial pandemic and uh, that led to an economic uh, uh, crisis which we're still in and we still got to uh, uh, get to grips with and I know a lot of our students who are on, on now and their, their counterparts are, are feeling that because they're in the, uh, some of those industries that have been directly effect, affected uh, as well but the final one of those which we went into 2020 with was the environment and you mentioned the Green Carnival uh, and the symposium that took place at Malcolm X uh, where people came from all over the uh, uh, of Britain, not just uh, uh, yeah. the UK. Uh, I'm sorry, England. Uh, uh, about that, carnival is always for for us with the uh, environmental belt, and we've always been part of that. Been uh, terrible, frankly, in terms of its. Uh, you know, there's polystyrene recy uh, recycling. Uh, none of that is is any of your responsibility. Moving forward, 2021 and beyond. What are the plans? What came out of that symposium? How can car uh, carnival uh, be greener? You know, you, again, cause this is where carnival touches on the elderly, touches on poverty, touches on culture, uh, uh, and it, uh, it touches on economics. There's so many different things. Here's one for environmentalism. Where are you now? <clears throat> where are we now? So um, I stated that um, at that carnival that I wanted to be, uh, I wanted us to be the, the, the greenest Caribbean car carnival in the UK. Um, so that that is a quite a lofty ambition, which um, is going to take work. Um, one of our lead costume designers was at that cost, that that um, that event. So we spoke about how we could start that with with costume making, recyclable materials, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I'm in talks with Mini Rig about um, they they uh, some of you may have seen that they they built and um, kitted out for sound the bug 
um, which is one of the vehicles that takes takes part in our procession and it's green. So one of the things we're talking about is how do we have vehicles that are off the grid for um, the procession. So that's something that we're talking about, off grid um, vehicles. Uh, I have been inspired by um, green and black, black and green. Um, my involvement with, with that project um, uh, very near its inception. It's it's just uh, one um, support and investment for the next few years. Um, I, I, I'm very interested in working with the Black and Green ambassadors to support building our strategy. But I think this is part of a wider community engagement piece. I'm really, I'm really, um, I think it's really important to understand, and it, it's, it's difficult with Carnival, but it's really important to understand that Carnival is just a platform. Um, we are the frame around the picture. The community to be that picture. They, 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 we, we provide a platform and it's for the community to, um, to bring the Carnival, as it were. I, do, I, don't, I don't believe in, in a patriarchal um, organisation that delivers Carnival to the it is a community event and therefore we, it has to have community engagement at its, at its centre. So um, one of the things that we are um, just about to do is to create um, a sustainability working group, which will be uh, attended by uh, some of the members on our board. But that is a, the perfect opportunity for us to involve um, uh, people like Manu, who's been doing some great work over at um, uh, St Werbert's Community Farm. Um, in, involve our, the residents who, you know, rightly have a concern about our environmental impact, um, and make sure that our strategy around greening carnival is is community has a community at the heart of it, and the community influence how that is developed. Absolutely. So co-creations there. So it's great to hear some of those uh, discussions uh, with the, uh, the Black and Green Project, uh, with Bristol Green Capital Partnership and, and, and partners. And obviously we're going to be uh, going to be coming back to you from Creative Connects in terms of uh, making that uh, uh, that case as we, we're working with uh, Bristol City Council to make some environmental films on, on that. Did you say Green in Carnival or Greener Carnival? Um, it's called a greener carnival. So there'll be stuff on Facebook. Um, um, yeah, on the Carnival Network South, there'll be some stuff on there about it. Um, there's a question here from School of Art and Design, sustainable fashion. Um, this is very serendipitous. I feel that, that question um, because today we were talking about um, about wanting to work with the universities to create um, a fashion show, which is about carnival, um, carnival dress, carnival art. Um, so I would be very interested in talking about sustainable fashion and how that fits in with our um, with our engagement and also our, our green kind of strategy. Woohoo! Yeah. <laughs> I know, um, again, we've had interest from a, a couple of uh, you students uh, there. For Fawn is, is one, uh, Sibella is another uh, as part of that. So we can, as part of this project, we can uh, make the link to start making that happen. Mian's uh, chief mover in, in that. Mian, do you, do you want to say anything? Or are you uh, OK for, for opening your mic up and just ask a direct question? Um. Uh, yeah, I'm very excited to hear that, Latoya. Um, let's meet up another time uh, to talk about this because, uh, in fact, we have a, a, a curator for sustainable fashion coming up in April for a talk. Uh, I'd like to invite invite you uh, oh, yes, to, to the talk and your colleagues. Um, yeah. Um, I will put my email in the chat group, or you can yeah. contact contact um, uh, uh, Roger directly. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll, I'll do the link up directly after. Great, yeah. thank you, Roger, and um, thank That's you, Mian. I'd be, I'd be more than happy to speak to you about that. And yes, I'd love an invite. Oh, that'd be great, and also to involve students in designing uh, and working with you. It'd be such a fantastic. Uh, uh, um, uh, experience for for all our fashion students mainly because it's to showcase um, 
such a wide range of skills they'll be doing. You know, that'd be fantastic. Thank you. No problem at all. And I think there's probably some links that we can make with our, our schools program as well, because I'm really interested yeah. in how we expose our um, our young people to different um, different uh, professions, different interests. Um, so, yeah, I think let's let's talk. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, yeah, I look forward to that. Thank you. Oh, that's 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 wonderful. I'm getting goosebumps just just thinking about I that. I know, it's amazing. Yeah, I I, I remember um, uh, you know, make, making the cultural case and saying, oh, can, kind of where where does fashion fits in? Fashion fits right at the heart of uh, of everything, from uh, culture of uh, 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 hip hop to uh, the costumes uh, uh, that are in, in those uh, 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 carnivals to. Uh, everything that you know, the flat cap that I'm 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 wearing today. There's a history and uh, and heritage behind fashion. So I'm fully, um, even though I'm not a designer myself, and especially uh, even if I um if I because uh, I'm at home. If I go to uh, um here, my mum, me, even that suit that you'll see there, she would have handmade that uh, herself, and that's the culture that we have. Uh, within the Caribbean from that Windrush generation, a knitted sense of crochet dress uh, is something that, they, you know, there was no going to the shops for her. She was making handmade dresses. Uh, oh, my God. All of my clothes when I grew up um, were um, handmade. And I, I really wish that I'd learned to sew. My nan is, you know, back to my nan, a great seamstress. Um, my mum my mum could do it as well, but not as, not as well as my nan. She made everything. Crocheted socks, crochet hats. Um, and it just it made I remember doing um, a sustainable a sustainability for black and green and black with you Roger and you talked about um, the Caribbean culture and how that kind of mend and make do approach to life meant that our voices in the kind of green space were just as valid as everybody else's and that yeah. I, I remember that because it knocked me for six and it really made me think oh my god Roger's right um, <laughs> No food got wasted. No material got wasted. You know, we we you know we come from a tradition where you um you're not wasteful because there's no, there's not much around, and that that means that you you care for your environment and you um you use everything that you can from your environment, and you're not wasteful. Every last scraps, and that's uh, the same for for most uh, uh, migrant communities uh, as mm -hmm. well. We're going to come to Chantel uh, uh, shortly, and then we're going to come back to your uh, uh, family in that picture and the use of uh, uh, imagery, as I've, I've just shown. But you did talk about um, uh, women, and I wanted to talk uh, 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 and ask some uh, of our audience any questions that you have around the, 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 the role of, uh, you know, in, in this week um, where we've had to kind of face as men some of our, our male privileges and uh, you know i'm always talking about um uh, kind of race and, and privilege but i have to kind of wrap my head around certain things understand the privileges i've got i've got a, a covid privilege because you know i don't have young children uh, uh to worry about anybody bursting through the door i mean you 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 and and i've got i can go in uninterrupted uh, uh so that's the, a certain privilege uh, uh well connected in bristol so i've got bristol privilege my male privilege, if I wanted to go for a run straight after here, I won't have to worry about who's looking on it around in, uh, uh, every co uh, corner. You talked of the resilience there. You very kind of name check the likes of, of, uh, of Marty, who would be a, uh, Marty, sorry, Marty Burgess, who would be a, a future speaker. You talked about Seder's uh, current work uh, today. I'll add to that list Joyce Stevenson, another nurse, um, uh, as well as Paul Stevenson's wife and Rock. Uh, during that that time, Princess Campbell, as well as uh, Barbara uh, Dettering and Dolores, again, who's our guest speaker uh, in your seat this time next week. Don't forget uh, uh, that. Uh, and the likes of uh, uh, Cleo Lake, also an environmentalist uh, and former uh, mayor, uh, sorry, Lord Mayor of Bristol. And again, again another one of our future uh, speakers. So just just from the audience, just, just, just any questions? Uh, are, are, are around the, the kind of uh, a bedrock, you know, myself being raised on uh, in terms of Mother's Day, my mum's birthday on Friday, but being raised by two women. So matriarchy to me was always something, uh, you know, particularly uh, those of us raised in single parents would be generally by, uh, by a woman. Matriarchy was something that was, was solid and nothing I, I feared. So when I 
see these things that are that are occurring not to say you know abuse happens in all in all in all communities but that that solid bedrock there of, of matriarch within the caribbean just wanted to know if you could just talk a little bit more about that and any questions from the audience please um i think yeah i've always understood it because i grew up within it and um i grew up with two women who did everything um decorate the house from top to bottom sew clothes provide food on the table just it never it and i, I think it never occurred to me also being a first born <laughs> child who was quite stubborn donkey headed um as as i've been called by mr griffith um it never occurred to me that i couldn't that i i would not be able to do something because i'm a woman because i grew up in an environment where women you know i saw women doing everything my role models were were women who despite the barriers that they faced because of um their sex because of their ethnicity that did not stop them from 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 doing what they they needed to do so um that strong matriarchal strand that runs through um the the caribbean traditions um and and african traditions as well in a slightly different way um i feel keenly here in bristol and i think maybe it's something to do with the size of the city um so connect i'm connected to some inspiring women that i feel that you know have have and continue to pave the way for the next generation of women to to stand on their shoulders and and do do the fantastic change making work that that uh, women have always always done um it's yeah it's inspirational to to be in the company of of some of the the women that I've named there because they they are forging ahead and making pathways and just you know the, all, all of those women have got well, they wear about several you know seven different hats um, they are well respected within within the city and within their community um, they are fearless um, and I think as a as an African Caribbean woman being fearless is is a strong part of of how you how you live your life and how you bring up your family and and um how you have to step forward in this world because the world it, the world that we live in is is kind of is it's not necessarily kind to to women or to black women uh, absolutely we've seen the one going around around um there's a, there's a one minute video uh, or tiktok I, I should say Get, you know, I need to get into the 21st century about that, that, that very case. So that's why I'm going to give you a, a, a little break now um, as we get to our cultural corner, uh, something that we want uh, uh, e uh, each time. And Chanel, I just don't know if you're going to, uh, if you can get uh, uh, ready uh, uh, to perform. So Chanel is uh, our, our student, uh, currently being mentored by uh, uh, Lawrence Hu. Um, delighted that she's going to uh, be working uh, with me directly um, to create a poetry project. Um, thanks to uh, uh, Mian's uh, uh, contact, uh, we've got po we're working with Poetry Screen and hopefully a couple of more community members to have a response to uh, uh, John Agar, a Guyanese poet, um, uh, and uh, taking that forward. But today I'm asked to, to, to take two poems. Uh, and we're going to hear the first of them now. Uh, Chanel, you there? Good evening. Good evening, Roger. Good evening, everyone. Um, Good evening to you. Hi, Chanel. Hi. Hey. The poem that I'm about to read now is called Times Have Changed. Excuse, my voice is slightly different than normal. I have a bit of a cough. Okay. Identity. Who is she? Force layers of fake placed by society. Unidentified roots destroyed. What's left hidden or and owned by supremacy? It's all going so far, everybody's starting to look like me, smell like me, shape like me. Because you see, Mr. Supremacy, the efforts you've made to rape me, take my true identity, then destroy me, has through time become your own enemy. Divisions getting harder as we mould into one. Your children are feeling, free, feeling freer and deciding they want to marry my black son. No eloping happening here, with heads held high, demanding you bring me that racist, why guy? He must come and show respect, 
keeping his own prejudgment and issues with raciality safely tucked away within the walls of his own vicinity. Times have changed. But I still want back my identity. You can keep your apology. That's the first. Well, well then. Was you wanting to uh, second off later on? At the end yeah, you're going to you're going to take us home and 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 close it out. So um, just give them a, a a little taster to keep them uh, waiting. Okay, Got some lovely comments, that. claps of hands, Fifon and Sophie. Thank you so much. Uh, 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 there, that's that, that's uh, uh, great. And it was you know never mind about that voice. That was uh, great. Mayor Ed says uh, a round of applause. Uh, I read that earlier and I thought, yes, that's what I want uh, as well. And I'm going to really look forward to to uh, working with you to develop this poetry project. As we said, we started with just an idea. I keep mentioning from just talking uh, um, with community members, but also talking to wider community members. And uh, speaking of, of, of Carnival, Tom, I don't know if you can just uh, line up the, the, the video trailer, please. Um, because Carnival uh, has never been something that's been solely just for uh, people of African Caribbean uh, nature uh, and, and background. Never been solely for people of uh, uh, from black black sport. There's no science that say that. It's been for everybody and every uh, to do exactly what they want to do. Uh, I was delighted um, previously, uh, many years ago, to work with uh, Stuart Napier. I just had a, 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 a conversation uh, uh, with him. Uh, and he just got some background into, into Carnival. I'm a you know, long-standing Carnival member. As I mentioned, I've been to uh, not only Bristol's, but uh, uh, growing up on my dad's shoulders in, Not uh, in Notting Hill, as well as visiting uh, Trinidad and, and, and Mardi Gras. I just get a feel of that. I didn't think anything of it. And then um, uh, he worked with um, a person that I know well, Jenny Davis, uh, and she wrote this and he, he directed it. So. Uh, this is what we're talking about in terms of the Windrush project, some of the inspirations that it can give. It doesn't have to, you have to really focus on the actual uh, Windrush itself. We're talking about what can spin off of it. And this was a story based on the background to Carnival. Uh, and it's uh, by uh, uh, Stuart Napier, who's gone on to win, win awards and screen it everywhere. And this is an inspiration of, of Carnival and Windrush. Take it away, uh, Tom. Thank you very much. <laughs> She'll keep her safe. Don't worry. I'm not having you disappoint that child again. You got your chance, so don't. Okay, Soraya. Stick the camera your best pose. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't I live with you? It's complicated. What does that mean? Difficult. <laughs> Where's Maxie? Look after her. Soraya, if you have to stop, that'll be the end of Carnival. I'll take you back. Soraya, stay very quiet and hide under here, okay? Why? Because there's someone trying to protect you, Rob. Keep that with you. No. Nothing's changed. I don't know. Soraya! We're not done yet. Soraya! Is she here? Thank you so much, Tom. Posted on the uh, St. Paul's Carnival uh, 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 website, Stuart Napier, um, who is a, uh, uh, not from our, our culture white background, but so inspired by the story. And what he did was engage local writers, and that's Jenny Davis, uh, and actors in Dallas and Nadia Williams, uh, that you can then see there, and, and others film crew there shot in the middle of carnival as it as it uh uh took place you were director during that that, that, that period how did that all come about and what, what what's been your reaction to the reaction of, of the world because it's uh you know I, I was in san francisco over a year uh, just over a year ago and as i was just leaving it was being screened there and it's like amazing uh, uh to me to see the the the, the, the saint paul's and bristol story go out throughout the world over to you Latoya. um <clears throat> We we screened. I, I met um, Stuart. Um, we we started talking in uh, twenty nineteen. Um, uh, so that film was made in twenty eighteen. It was made during the fiftieth year anniversary of of Carnival. Um, 
and we wanted to um, do something with it. We wanted to premiere it in Bristol, but it, it didn't happen. Um, and then in 2020, it, because we had the digital carnival, it felt like the perfect opportunity to do that. Um, and Stuart stays in touch and he, he you know, I get a few emails from him every every couple of months saying, you know, it's won an award here or it's been screened um, in, you know, L.A. Um, African Film Festival. Um, and then all of a sudden, it, you know, I think that, you know, the, the screening of it during the digital carnival helps give it that platform. But all of a sudden it, it took off and um, it's it's just it's absolutely amazing. It's a great um, advert for Bristol for St. Paul's Carnival. Um, I love the fact that it's, you know, it was written by um, Jenny Davis, a Bristolian. It's, it has Dallas in it, one, you know, a, 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 a regular and famous face you know, within our city. Um, so what I guess what's really important to me is that Stuart, it, 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 it is a very respect, it's very respectful to the traditions and culture of Carnival. Um, and it, I think it's, I, I really enjoyed the, um, the screening and the Q and A that you compared um, uh, last year, Roger. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's it is quite amazing that we have gone global via that that film. I I, I totally share, uh, uh, you, and that, and that's why I'm, I've 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 screened it here because think people like like Carnival and it's a black thing. It's it's a it's an every person thing, sure. Uh, you know, as a proud black man, I want it rooted within our culture, but it's the sharing uh, 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 of, of our culture and cultures, because we're not just, you know, I've had my DNA tested, and you believe what it, what it says. There's some Swedish in there somewhere, so I've got to go find and see some Vikings, uh, uh, see what they uh, did well back in, uh, in, the, in the day. But what Stuart has done there in terms of pr uh, directing and producing it, and importantly, I have to say, engaging local uh, not just it's uh, just not just a cut and run like i say i get emails from him all the time and like i'm i'm, I'm amazed by that and uh it's the collaboration the collection of of coming yes. to uh, yes. coming together that that's the heart of it and first and foremost the promotion of uh of our culture and carnival as part of that we wouldn't want to uh, uh to share and be uh, and be a part of that um but it's it's grounded very much in the in the community yeah and i think you know I, I've, I've said this already, but you know, I, as, as an organisation, we are a platform, we are a frame around a picture, um, and it's great to see when you know that that picture or that platform is is built by something that represents the community, that represents um, the the city, um, and that c can give that gives voice to Carnival. That is that is yeah that's kind of come from that makeup of all of the different colors and textures of our cultures it's 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 a joy to see um so yeah i was i was really proud to be able to screen that during digital carnival last year it was i i think it really um added something special to the to that um fringe program excellent uh, and did you say picture did i did you say picture did you mention the words of the uh, picture in what you just said Yes, I did. Great. Tom, can you come to my presentation? Because that's what we're going to get to next, the picture of Dylan. Frame around the picture. See, I'm, I've lost my radio touch. I've got I, you know, I to I keep these corny lines and uh, going no, just, in no. case they, they, <laughs> just, just in case they get me back out of retirement, uh, um, which I'm uh, in due to my grey uh, hair. Uh, I don't think uh, and they the line. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, uh, look at that. Oh, you haven't seen that? I didn't see that slide, no. Yes, that's your, um, that's uh, you and uh, us in uh, my soul sister there. And we've had Ch uh, Chantal. Uh, that was our ideation session. That oh. picture. Children of the Windrush Generation comes to our, our uh, piece to take us uh, to the, uh, uh, the end. And again, please keep your questions coming. I'm happy to. I uh, uh, keep the, uh, narrating uh, if there's no uh, uh, questions because when you um, and again this has only uh, occurred in the last 24 hours but it's talking about two people on, on, on the same wavelength uh, uh, here um, I saw that 
and I just thought it was wonderful. It's not something I ever did. I, roti was, uh, as, unfortunately, is not going to be a skill uh, that's with us, but uh, that's what they're making. Roti is a Guyanese dish, uh, which we take, actually, about, that's what I'm saying, about uh, Mian will know exactly what I'm talking about when I talk about cross cultures, because uh, I know she's got her, her, her Caribbean heritage. We've taken this one from uh, uh, South Asia, from India uh, specifically. And the food I, was, I didn't realize until later on in my life, the food I was eating uh, wasn't even English or African in origin, it was more uh, Indian because we've got a deep percent Indian uh, population in uh, Guyana. But it's, it's that legacy that we're handing down there uh, now, which you've passed down to your son uh, just 24 hours ago in your very kitchen uh, there. Talk us through uh, that picture and, that, and certainly the, the, the children of the, the next generation. Uh, next generation. Uh, yeah. So, um, I've already spoken about this today to my board. This is how excited I was about <laughs> about um, this picture and how I feel about roti. Um, roti to me is um, is my favourite dish that my nan cooked. Um, she she made it very rarely because she worked you know she worked long hours. And I've already spoken to you about her being an orderly um, in a hospital. So um, I very rarely, but roti takes a bit of a while to make. And I just figured out last night that I think she she didn't work on Fridays because she only ever made it on a Thursday, which is why to this day, Thursday is my favorite day of the week. Um, so last night I decided I wanted to make a fish curry and um, I thought, you know what? I haven't made roti in a while, so I'm gonna make it. it does take a while, a while to eat. We ate late last night. Um, and Dylan wanted to help me. This is my, my 11 year old, um, Dylan um wanted to help me make it now just i'm going to rewind a little bit because my nan i grew up at my nan's knee she taught me how to make roti when i was very young but um it, i always saw it as a complicated process and in london you can buy roti skins anywhere so one when i moved to bristol and couldn't find roti skins I, every time i went back to london i would pick up a set of roti skins put them in my freezer and that would have to do until i went to london again but in lockdown one, I Sorry, decided Latoya, I would... Latoya, Latoya, can we have a little translation here? What do you mean by skins? I know what you mean, but... Oh, um, the, sorry, the, the, the actual roti. Roti is a flat leavened bread, um, and you can call it your roti skins. Roti skins is the plain roti before you could eat it with anything else, which is what, what my son has hold of there. Thanks, Roger. Um, so I perfected my roti game during lockdown one, and I have not looked back since then. I have not bought roti since then. Um, I always make it and learn that actually it's not that co that complicated. And when when I started, when I sort of got into that during um, lockdown last last year, um, the first time I made it, I was almost in tears. I was ecstatic because I got the colour of it right. Um, I got you know, um, I got the flakiness of it right, which meant I got the process right. Um, and my my kids were just like, why are you just jumping all over the kitchen and I was like I, I've I have finally become I, I can take up my mantle as a Guyanese woman I can make my own roti and it tastes like roti my nan used to make it, it yeah I, you know if you follow me on Facebook or Twitter every so often I will have a roti story this is how much it means to me but um the, the I think the, the real thing is that I watched my nan make this for the family growing up it is a part of being a Guyanese woman that she handed over to me that I've only just realized and 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 kind of come into my own with it in the last year. So yesterday I made a batch of roti and this is a picture of my son who was about to clap the roti. So once you make when you make it you um you do one round you put the fat in it and then you roll it up back in so and leave it back to prove so when you roll it out again it has lots of different layers of dough and fat and to bring those layers out you have to clap it once it's cooked so you throw it up in the air and clap it um, and this is what Dylan is doing here and I took a picture of him because for me um, and this is why we I spoke to Roger about coming full back full circle to this this is the embodiment of the journey of my mum and my nan um the cultural heritage that they are passed through to me that i am now passing on to my child um and this picture makes me feel absolutely joyous because i hope that one day he will be standing in his kitchen with his child 
saying that my mum taught me to do this and her nan taught her to do that. I feel choked up talking about it because it means that much to me. Um, but this, this for me is full circle. It, it kind of, um, it, it, you like a roti skin, it wraps everything that we were talking about that I've been talking that I presented on tonight. It wraps it up into a package which speaks of legacy, the legacy of our cultural heritage and, and how that those traditions are passed down from from woman to woman, from from mother to son, from son to whatever whoever he he passes this down to. Um, it speaks of resilience, the resilience of of um, our Windrush generation, the the hostile environment that they came to that they weren't expecting. Um, them making lemonade out of lemons, passing that down to to their children who have been able to do a little bit, little bit better, have been able to get around the table where they have influence. I pass this down to my son now, hoping and hoping that his time will be a little bit better than mine. When he passes that down to his son, he'll be hoping for, um, yeah, hopefully we would have stopped having a lot of these conversations about social inequalities. But it's for me, this this picture just really, really wraps up everything we um, this Rogers project is doing here. Um, and what we what we do as as um, African people in the diaspora, um, passing down our the bits of our African heritage that remain through our um, Caribbean connection, passing down our Caribbean um, heritage as well. Um, and when my son passes it down, no doubt there'll be some British heritage mixed up in that. Uh, absolutely. Um, uh, I'm getting even emotional because I'm had, um, I'm not had any uh, a, a roti for a good few uh, months. I know when we go out there, you know, we, we we carry away all the skins uh, uh, back down the M M M4 well with, uh, with us. And uh, you know, my partner's uh, American and she loves her um, Indian food. Spent some time out there and. Uh, uh, the, the roti that she's tasted from my mum, uh, but we have we, we, we got to get that chana in the middle because we. Yeah, that's, we next. that's next. <laughs> so that's in the Caribbean. We have all the yeah, I know. Yeah, you're still on the way. You, you, so it's, it's like those uh, girl guides where you get some. Uh, you got you got your um you got your silver medal. I'm going to give you. Oh, my entry badge. I've got my entry yeah. badge. <laughs> yeah, you got your entry badge. No, yeah, yeah. I'm going to give you a silver for that because you passed the legacy down, but. Gold medal won't come until you get the China in the middle, man. I mean, that's, that's go, my favorite. Uh, it's next, definitely. So, um, on a sacrilege, you can buy them in the shops. They have to be homemade. Um, I think you, you need to, um, you need to get practicing. Yeah, I, I, my skills. I, I'm a main meal guy. I'm a big, I'm a big food man. So, um, uh, pastries and. Uh, uh, um, pastry is not my my thing. We have got a chef on, the, you know, lined up. They do work some unsociable hours, so I'm trying to in the, the. And obviously we're in COVID, um, but uh, hopefully we'll, we'll, we have got uh, the singing chef Glenn Crook um, will be appearing later in the year. Um, uh, uh, Sophie really built a beautiful reminder how important food and, and being connected to grandmas. Sophie, do you have a story that you want to uh, tell us and share us? Uh, share with us. You can open up your mic and uh, and uh, about about food or about carnival or any any connections. Going to open up the mic now to uh, you, the audience, uh, 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 tonight in our final few minutes before uh, we get Chantel to uh, to close. Okay. Hi, Roger. Hello, everyone. You're right. Hi. Hi. Hello. Um, I was think I've been thinking about food a bit recently, actually, because I um, so it's it's like funny hearing about like um, yeah, the whole like make do thing as well with like sustainability and all that sort of thing. Because I went and um, I got a too good to go box um, from uh, was it Victory Stores in Stapleton, and I got the biggest yam that I've ever seen. <laughs> it was like my, it was like the lower half of my leg and I had to like, <laughs> had several bags to carry. It was me and my 
friend and my boyfriend and we all had to carry one thing and I could just carry this one yam by myself <laughs> and um, I called so my family's um, Jamaican and I called I called my mum on the way home and I was like mum what do I do <laughs> what do I do with this yam and um, I made because um, I'm vegetarian so I made some ital stew um, which for everyone anyone doesn't know it's just like basically yeah just like vegetarian Jamaican and um yeah, I still got this yam. I'm going to be eating it for a long time. But um, it was nice to just, like, actually just, yeah, cook it myself, I guess, and not just, like, yeah, be, like, because, um, so my grandma passed away when I was, like, 12 or so. And my mum's the baby as well, so uh, it's, like, all her older sisters um, oh. came from Jamaica. My mum was born here. Um, so, it's yeah, it's been a very long time since I've had, like, something that's, like, cooks like by someone who's actually from Jamaica so it's just like cooking like cooking Jamaican food like for myself like it just like yeah it feels like really special to be able to do Basically, absolutely yeah. that's, that's that's a wonderful story thank you so much for uh, um letting us know of, of that and um you know what Latoya's said is just sparking so many uh memories when we started the project didn't didn't really know where it was going to go or uh how it was going to uh, uh, come about um if you think about it, obviously food is uh one of those you know music being another uh um in terms of like, people like massive talent, the stable food caught the wolf in 91 ways another fantastic woman from uh, uh, uh from bristol uh, uh and her project but I, I i can think of uh my white friends i used to be you know i'm i'm London born, but brought up in uh, uh, Bristol, coming into my mum's kitchen uh, back in Lawrence Weston and then tasting carob and their faces used to light up and then taking them down into carnival. And it was just like amazed when you've been with your, you, you know, your white brothers uh, and, and uh, 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 who were there, you're what we now know as allies uh, and they're, they're sharing that, that, that culture. That's what I mean. And just, uh, just seeing their faces just light up like it was like Christmas, like they've never tasted anything and like it's standard for us. But it, they, it's like, wow, this is amazing. And, I, and they used to yam it down and, and thinking of like carnival and then you know, dancing, you know, well before there was uh, there was no curfew. Because uh, like I say, I'm 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 old, uh, uh, so you know we never used to go home until this, literally until you weren't allowed to go in my group. You weren't allowed to go home until the sun rose, uh, and the people will still go on even then. Then you were weak uh, at six seven in the morning because the sun was was rising. You could not leave, even if you had to go in, on the on the green for a little while. You couldn't leave until the sun rose. Uh, from there, all of those memories are, are, are cultural expressions that sh that are shared that we do not want to lose that we want to share with wider co uh, communities. Your thoughts, Latoya? Um, ab absolutely. I mean, just listening to to Sophie's story and and thinking about um, that con that connection and well, something that Sophie Sophie said um, just reminded me that um, my nan my nan is the last of her generation. Um, and she, although my mum's Guyanese, she came here when she was 10. So she, she's very British. So part, part of, um, what is really important to me is, is, is keeping that, that, um, that bit of my Nan alive, that bit of Guyana alive, that bit of, um, what came before Britain, before the UK. Um, so this kind of, food connection, the, the kind of memories of going to carnival with my mum when I was eight, the, 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 it is all, all wrapped up in the memories that I think, you know, I'm not a storyteller in the way that my nan was, but um, the, I, I tell my stories through the work that I do, the things that I get involved with, and the, the, the food heritage that I pass down to, to our children. My, my youngest is four, and that boy literally we I did I cooked six I, I made eight roti last night I've got two in the freezer because Geffen my husband wants to try something with them and so we had six between the four of us and there was half a roti left today my youngest just rams it down he loves it um and there was something that is really pleasurable about seeing my kids love their roti like that and I just think this is this is the thing that I this is the thing that I have to pass down to you. Uh, I, my husband's family 
are Welsh. They are Baptist ministers um, by by heritage, and they had, you know, one of his grandfathers. They're they're also writers and authors. Um, his uncle has written a book about the, his granddad, who was a conscientious uh, objector. His grandmother um, was part of the Bletchley um, cr- cr- uh, code breaking crew. Um, my 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 children have a really rich heritage from their dad's side and one of the things that i think was stolen from us is being able to look back mm. at our heritage beyond the caribbean but the caribbean is important but it's not home it's not our you know it's the end of a a, a story for us and the beginning of another one um so i i sometimes feel that my i have well i do i feel that i have been robbed of that and that my children have been robbed of that to some extent so what this does for me is to, to 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 help them grow and appreciate something about their cultural heritage that they can then pass down and that 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 there is some line some lineage being created in in um the, the love of food and the love of um carnival and, and things like that 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 define us absolutely i mean you know really deep uh, and, and and really emotional connections it's so important to our children the stories uh, we cannot lose these stories, and uh, that's from uh, uh, Alicia. And uh, absolutely, that's why we, we so believe passionately in this uh, in this in this project as a uh, and it, and it is just a, a beginning. I want to go back to Sophie. Uh, uh, Sophie, do you mind just telling us a little bit about your grandfather? I mean, we've been in communication. Just just a little. Uh, uh, only share what you, you, you what you like in connection uh, 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 with us. Uh, your student at, uh, at UE and just your your um your grandfather's connection. Yeah, sure. Um, so, um, yeah, so my granddad came to, so my pet, my mum grew up in um, northwest London in Harlesden and um, my granddad came there in the, what was it, I think 1960, 1961 and he stayed for a year and then um, my grandma and my oldest auntie came, um, they came to, came to meet him here and um, my one of my other aunties um she was um i think she was 18 months at the time and she was she was left there and she was raised by her grandma um still back in jamaica and she didn't come um to london until i think she was about eight by which time um i think yeah all of her younger siblings have been born so my other auntie my uncle and my mum um so that was yeah that was um that was crazy for her um, but I guess that's quite common for a lot of people who um, got sent for like years later. Um, and yeah, so basically, yeah, my parents, my parents, yeah, from London, and then we moved out of London when I was born. And then yeah, I think yeah, the, we don't have loads of um, Caribbean family in um, in the UK really, or back home to be honest. Like most people, um, yeah, most people came here and didn't go back so it's like it would be interesting to actually be able to go back to Jamaica because one of my aunties did go there one of the ones that was born there but um because we wouldn't have anybody to stay with she went and like stayed in the hotel and stuff and it's just like such a different experience and I guess like what you were saying about how um like it yeah like the sort of history has been robbed from us a little bit as well of like people yeah like the Caribbean was kind of like a ending like settling point and it's like none of us really have any clue what happened before then or like any records of anything like my grandma doesn't even didn't even know her real birthday um because it was wrong on her passport and her mum always thought there's something different as well so it's like yeah I don't know it's 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 interesting because it's like you never know what the real history is because it's all stories and anything that I heard directly is a story from my grandma when when I was 12 and she was like 85 or something so it's like yeah you never know you never really know where you're from so it's yeah it's sort of just like creating the connections through the things that you know and like the cultures that have been like passed down and stuff See, and, and those those are wonderful stories and some of the touch points you said about history 
about you as a, a you know you know third and fourth maybe third even fifth generation not not known about those stories as Alicia said it's so important we tell our children those stories we cannot lose those stories you even touched on some of the scandal uh, 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 elements of the project uh, in terms of your um, your uh, mother not uh, you know not having the proper date because we were asked or some sort of part of the scandal to to go and find documents that never existed because uh, yeah. they, they were allowed in uh, uh, as part of that so even that is a, is, a, is another narrative that we can we can pull within go ahead Sophie I interrupted no it's okay yeah um, yeah yeah my yeah it's yeah it's so crazy as well because like yeah because my grandma um she was also dyslexic um and her and my granddad got they they yeah neither of them went to school or anything in Jamaica and they got their sort of like I guess GCSE equivalent in their 60s um which was really cool because they'd obviously just been working their whole lives and stuff and yeah and then when they retired they started um like working on like improving their English and stuff and um yeah like it, I think it was really hard for my aunties and uncles as well because they didn't have that knowledge of like I guess yeah this is the whole thing like with all the scandal and stuff it's like so it was such a trap for people who came to the UK and didn't have like that level of like knowledge and education about how systems work um and then yeah it really fell on to like my mum and my aunties and my uncle to like be the responsible adult for their parents sort of because it's like they're they're just working so it's like all of that other stuff falls on the children to sort out and it's like fortunately my family is lucky that um with the whole windrush scandal and whatnot no one um no one suffered for it but like there's so many people who it's like just because they just didn't know when they came here no one taught them and they didn't have or might not have even had the level of education or understanding to make sure that their citizenship and stuff was safe like yeah it's just scary to think like exactly. how real that of a problem that was and like how that could have affected my grandparents if they'd been less lucky mm. really it, it, absolutely it, it, exactly they were like lambs to the slaughter they it, remember they thought they were british they didn't know that there was no defining line that was in their school there was just an extension of 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 the of the mainland in the, in the caribbean sure they were in a different place in space but listening to my uncles and aunties and, and, and documenting um you know for the for the book and uh, you know my mum uh my dad you you couldn't get a more fiercer patriot my my grandfather never even reached there he was in the he was in the in the masons i've seen him in uh, in an outfit so they never knew there was going to be any, any of these barriers but forget there was no racism out there there might have been colorism my people were dark so um uh, they had uh, a touch of that from the plantation, but there was never um, a any racism that they faced with that, that uh, no uh, blacks, no Irish, uh, no dogs that I, uh, uh, I began with. Latoya, your comments, uh, please. And uh, Chantal, if you can get ready for, uh, uh, Chanel, sorry, if you can get ready for uh, to close this out uh, very shortly. Over to you, Latoya. Um, I think, yeah, Sophie raises a really good point about um, the, the Windrush um, generation scandal another another reason for um that bitterness um where again you you're invited over invited to um help rebuild the motherland and then x amount of decades down the line you're told that motherland is to sending you back home to somewhere that you haven't been or you know my mum came on my nan's passport as so many of that generation did and you know i had to check in with her and you know she she's a civil servant um, so she had to naturalise quite some time ago. But as Sophie said, that could have been any of our aunts, uncles, parents. Um, it is, a, it is an, an absolute disgrace um, that our, our elders and people who have worked their lives and paid their taxes in this country should, should be treated in, in that way. Just it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a disgrace. And, and um, as you know, I am British. I was born here. I have British sensibilities um, on one hand, but on the other hand, um, again, part of, part of the, 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 the challenge with the positions that we find ourselves in is that you, you, you feel other um, and that that is a, 
that that's a challenge to reconcile um in the in the country that you were born and that the only place that you can really call home is 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 britain the uk um but i i, I you know i believe that i stand apart from from the britishness that my white friends feel um i feel that my family are stand apart from that and i always wonder i think a lot about um the, the point that you raised about no no racism in um in the caribbean colorism yes racism no um are, are the, the the african friends for Af african friends born on the, on the continent talk about um not understanding that they were black until they came here um my um nigerian friend who now lives in the caribbean and has done for five years or so has said that and she faces her own challenges over there from being african and not caribbean but um she is in a black majority place and she doesn't ever think she could live anywhere else and i completely understand why that would be because in those places you're, you you know you're you don't have to think about being black and one of the conversations that i'm having around diversity and inclusion is is for people to you know people who are not of color white people to understand um how uh the significance of or the privilege of never having to think about being white just being and the difference in when you are not having to think about that all the time in any space that you're in um so yeah i mean i find these things very interesting to to, to think about because that they are they are things that um they are issues that we are still grappling with um, not just as a as a group of people, but in in our host country is still grappling with that history, um, and I, I think there is an opportunity now for us to try and address some of those um, or redress some of those historical things. But um, yes, challenge. Absolutely, and we still are grappling with those as a uh, as as a region. Uh, you think the uh, conversations around the European Union. Uh, I've, I've been bitter. That's just like a tea party compared to uh, West Indian Federation and, and CARICOM uh, discussions uh, uh, across the, the, the nations, I, I can assure you. Uh, just wait. To, uh, a cricket selection uh, can cause literally diplomatic arguments between uh, uh, one country and another. But that's for another story and, a, and, a, and another day. We do have sport as part of our um, uh, looking at we've we, uh, you, we've seen him on the uh, television recently. Let's talk about race. Vernon Samuels will be uh, the uh, Olympic triple jumper uh, and represented Great Britain will be uh, a future speaker. Part of our great portfolio of, of talks. I just put up on on the on there that you can see these are some of the ideas that have been put forward. Ideas for an easing, which. A couple of people have, 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 have uh, contacted me about and have uh, contacted about uh, a film. We've already had a, a, a podcast. Mian's work with with her students, Charlie Long, has has, has, has made that. So we've got that in the library, resource library. We're collecting all things Windrush. We want to be uh, a digital resource. I'm not saying it's the first or the last, but just within Bristol, just anything uh, around uh, research uh, 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 as a resource library, films, books. Uh, and magazines will we'll, um, continue to keep a, a, a library of that and uh, find a way of showcasing uh, uh, that poetry uh, as we've got just about to hear to take us out as I said we've got the uh, thanks to again uh, uh, me and Anna Alicia uh, as, as work uh, as well we've got um, a poetry project uh, up and running and I'll be speaking to creative writing team later the, uh, this week uh, as, and hopefully engage some of the journalism and history students as well. So those are some of the ideas that are coming forward from the project. Uh, I just want this stuff aired and it's just been a, a wonderful um, just to hear uh, uh, Latoya's uh, reflections. Uh, we didn't know when it was going to go. There's been no rehearsals. Uh, she knows the way I work, just like a, to have these types of uh, uh, conversations where she's reflected on carnival and its impact. Uh, its cultural and economic uh, significance and firmly rooting uh, the black community within Bristol uh, and its wider implications 
southwest and and beyond and it's green uh, uh, influences now as it moves into the 21st century both digitally and looking at its responsibilities for the environment and community then she's really reflected on uh, that those that cultural imprint from Windrush to her uh, particularly her the, uh, the role of the matriarch her, her mother and grandmothers and their uh, uh, four parents which has got a real big connection to uh, some of our, our students today, and particularly uh, Sophie uh, and, and many others, and, and Alicia have put in there uh, 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 as well. And also connected uh, through her children uh, and a particular partner. And I'll add that her uh, husband is, is a chef, so he knows his, his, his food as well, as having that great Welsh uh, well ancestry uh, uh, as well. As being, and that, how that is connected and rooted, uh, and also that longing for. Uh, um, um, and things that have been denied to her in terms of the, uh, the great, great, great uh, grandparents that we've all missed because we don't know. It's just, a, it's just a line there where we see uh, those parents and we, we look at with jealousies at our African-American cousins or our British uh, uh, counterparts when they can go back generations that was denied uh, uh, to us. I can only go back two generations in terms of I know and, the, and, a, and a wall of silence within my family. But... Um, we move from the, uh, the bitterness uh, um, and, and into the light. Um, so we're, we're encouraging you uh, to make those, those, those questions, make those uh, uh, connections uh, as well. Before we go to uh, Chanel, I just want to say big thanks to my team, and my co-leads, uh, Alicia, Mian, uh, my team, uh, Millie, Izzy, and, and Ben, have been great in promoting uh, the project and will continue uh, to, uh, to do that. Uh, and a lady called Chloe Smith as well, um, on uh, from the creative writing side, who's, who's done some great stuff in, in terms of getting the, uh, uh, things out. Latoya, I'm going to give you your final words, and then Chanel will take us uh, out of, of today. It's been a real pleasure to be here and to do this reflection with you um, and the uh, other other guests. Thank you very much for coming to to listen to my talk on carnival and and um, heritage and and how how they connect. Um, I think this is a wonderful project, um, and I'm hoping that uh, St Paul's Carnival can connect with that um, that kind of Windrush resource um, library because it's something that um, I think the time the time is now. Um, we have elders um, that we need to make sure that their legacy is passed down. So I'm I'm very pleased to be part of this, um, and yeah, look forward to seeing more from you. Absolutely, we'll be in touch, and certainly around uh, what was uh, historically known as um, uh, the fringe uh, events. And thank you so much for uh, that wonderful um, sharing of your your journey. Uh, and we look forward to working for you, with you uh, again. So, uh, our final uh, piece of poetry before we close for the season comes from uh, Chanel uh, R.A. Bartley. Take it away, Chanel. Good evening again. This last poem I'm doing this evening is one I did on the first Windrush lecture. I just thought I'd take you back because it's inspired by my grandmother who and my father who are first generation Windrush. Okay. They came in their best outfits, the ones better than their Sunday best, with an invitation from England to come help build up the land. Jobs galore, we all can strive. The tale in full belief that it is gold that paved streets. Unfortunately, reality wasn't so sweet. It were in some sense an invitation to a new form of slavery, a one you entered willingly to better the future of the British economy. Sharing a room between five families in areas that nobody wants to be, slaving away for measly pennies, wondering when they can afford to go home and eat from the land they once ate from for free. Thank you very much. Good night. Absolutely wonderful, and um, it's just a pleasure just to be working both with my colleagues and uh, you, you know from the likes of um, Sophie and Chanel and uh, Fafan and uh, uh, plenty of others. Thank you to Tom as well as part of this uh, great team, uh, and uh, again thank you to our keynote speaker, our guest lecturer. I told you there was uh, great knowledge in our community, Latoya McAllister Jones. Next week 
uh, same time, same place, please, for Andalus Shokan, uh, and also uh, Patricia Rose um, uh, uh, as well, two great bastions from our community, talk about that, that matriarch uh, there, uh, different uh, windrush journeys uh, will be shared. Uh, on, on this, we're looking for our medical students to, uh, uh, again as, uh, as part of, of that, but also uh, to develop those projects. Everybody who's written to me, I will be in touch as I have been uh, today. Thank you so much on behalf of everybody from the project and University of West England, Bristol and Creative Connects. Uh, and it's good night and enjoy your evening. Thank you so much. <laughs>